It's uh, my great pleasure uh, to, to introduce Stephanie Cam Lee Yi. Uh, she's a research fellow uh, with the International Centre uh, for Political Violence and Terrorism Research uh, at the Rajaratnam School of International Studies in Singapore. Um, Stephanie's research uh, focus lies primarily on the history of terrorism in the Asia Pacific region and specifically uh, in Southeast Asia. And this afternoon, Stephanie's uh, going to round out our, uh, our focus on uh, the foreign policy dimensions of China's uh, dilemmas with terrorism by focusing in on recent developments in terms of Uyghur militant connection in, in Southeast Asia. Uh, and our discussant uh, is Dr. Uh, Zhang, uh, Zhang from uh, University of New South Wales at ADFA here in, here in Canberra. Uh, and so after, after Stephanie speaks, I'll invite uh, Dr. Zhang to share his thoughts. Thank you, Dr. Clark, uh, for uh, inviting me here today. I must, uh, I must confess that uh, th this, uh, this is a work that is still in progress, uh, so um, please bear with me, but I'm happy to take questions after uh, today's presentation. Uh, my uh, paper for today uh, focuses on the question uh, of, on whether there is, is or is there not a Uyghur militant connection in Southeast Asia. And in my presentation, uh, I will uh, focus on the following. Uh, first, provide an introduction of the definition of key terms, which uh, earlier a couple of uh, the speakers had already done, um, followed by the, uh, some of the, the, the more recent developments of the Uyghur movement into Southeast Asia. Uh, the next section will be followed by uh, an attempt to provide a theoretical framework to this phenomenon of the Uyghur movement into Southeast Asia and um, uh, their potential for radicalization and recruitment uh, by terrorist groups such as the Islamic State. Uh, in my paper, I attempt to uh, use the framework uh, drawing on uh, Nietzsche's uh, Struggle for Recognition uh, framework to explain the um, the causes driving the weak grievances into Southeast Asia. Uh, this will be followed by analysis of the further conditions that uh, in my uh, research uh, looking at Southeast Asia of the factors conducive for Southeast Asia's Uyghurs to turn to militancy. Uh, last but not least, um, conclusion uh, with brief uh, discussion of implications and some policy recommendations. Uh, in my paper, I will use the definition by uh, Michelowitz of terrorism as def uh, defined as the use or threat uh, of use of extra normal uh, violence to obtain a political objective through intimidation or fear directed at a wider audience. Uh, the second uh, definition uh, which I deal with in my paper is the term of uh, refugees, which I feel a, a need to define um, according to the 1951 convention, uh, the UN convention, uh, on re relating to the status of refugees. Uh, refugees are defined uh, basically as uh, persons who, owing to a well-founded fear of being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group or political opinion, is outside the country of his nationality and is unable or uh, owing to such fear, is unwilling to avail himself of the protection of that country or who, not having a nationality and being outside the country of his former habitual residence as a result of such events is unable or owing to such fear is unwilling to return to it. Uh, this includes what uh, the United Nations uh, Human, uh, the, the, the Refugee Convention refers to as uh, re persons of concern, which is defined interchangeably as refugees, asylum seekers, return refugees, internally displaced persons, return internally displaced persons, uh, stateless persons and various other, others. Uh, a look at, um, in, in my research, I, I attempted to trace the Uyghur movement into South Asia, uh, Southeast Asia, uh, dating back to 2009, um, and during which the first waves, uh, the first wave of uh, Uyghur movement into South Asia, Southeast Asia uh, uh, coincided with the, uh, the Strike Hard campaigns in 2009, uh, the Uramchi, following the Uramchi riots. Um, in 2009, uh, Cam the Cambodian government uh, deported a group of 20 Uyghurs who had been seeking asylum back to China. Uh, in the following year, uh, Laos uh, deported seven uh, Uyghurs. Uh, that included a 34-year-old man and his wife and their five children. Uh, in 2011, uh, Malaysia also 
uh, deported 24 uh, Uyghur refugees. Uh, this was in a report by Amnesty International, uh, in which the Uyghur refugees um, were reported to have been arrested and uh, following that report, um, deported back to their country. Uh, in December 2012, uh, Malaysia uh, uh, deported six Uyghur men who were using fake uh, passports. 2014, um, Thailand Thai police rescued about uh, 200 people who believed to be Muslim Uyghurs from a human smuggling camp in southern Thailand. In April of 2014, uh, 16 Uyghurs were detained by uh, Vietnamese border guards when they were trying to enter Vietnam illegally. Um, the result of the arrest um, uh, saw backlash from the uh, Uyghurs who seized the, guns, uh, the guards' guns and attacked them with knives. Uh, five Uyghurs and two of the guards were killed. Um, the rest of the 11 Uyghurs were then uh, deported back on 21st of April. Uh, in 2014, in, on, in June, uh, the Philippines uh, also uh, deported five Uyghurs. Uh, these Uyghurs, according to reports, had uh, reached the Philippines using fake uh, Turkish passports. Uh, they had att attempted to go to Basilan from Sabah to meet personalities linked with the um, uh, southern Philippines uh, bandit group based in Mindanao, the Abu Sayyaf group. Uh, they had also visited uh, Katabato City, where they had uh, attempted to meet with personalities associated with the Bangsa Moro Islamic Freedom Fighters, another um, armed criminal group based in southern Philippines. Um, in the same year, uh, Indonesia, the New Indonesian police detained four Uyghurs for attempting to meet with Santoso, uh, who is the, the leader, the, the, but were re was recently killed um, uh, of the Mujahideen Indonesia uh, Timor, the MIT. Uh, four Uyghurs were arrested and three were sentenced to six years. In 2014, in October, uh, Malaysian authorities detained 155 Uyghurs, uh, more, of them, more than half of them children. Uh, this was followed by the deportation of 109 Uyghur militants, uh, Uyghurs back to um, China in July 2015, uh, and following that, uh, the uh, Erewhon Shrine attack in, in August 2015, uh, in which 17 suspects in total and two out of which two Uyghur suspects were arrested. In November 2015, uh, the uh, Indonesian security forces uh, shot dead and a Uyghur called uh, Farouk, uh, also known as Magalasi, uh, when they attacked Santoso's militant group. And in December 2015, one Uyghur man named uh, Ali was arrested. Uh, he was found to have bomb making manual, uh, have a bomb making manual and list of jailed uh, Indonesian terrorists as well as Indonesians uh, believed to have gone to Syria to join this uh, the, the terrorist uh, organization, the Islamic State. Uh, in 15th of March 2016, uh, this year, uh, police uh, shot dead two uh, Uyghurs who were allegedly fighting with the um, with the MIT, and the men, uh, the two men. Uh, the two men's names were Nuratin Alias Abdul and Magalasi Batusan Alias Farouk. Uh, in 24th of April 2016, uh, Indonesian police uh, killed as, uh, another uh, Uyghur uh, militant who was a member of the MIT during a crossfire. Um, and Following the last two incidents uh, in May, uh, very recently, and in July, uh, Indonesian police arrested a Uyghur who was attempting to uh, enter Indonesia via Batam. Uh, he was deported, to, subsequently deported to China. And in July, a uh, suicide bombing attack took place in Solo, uh, and uh, one uh, Uyghur was killed uh, in this suicide bombing attack. Uh, so the findings from the table indicate a growing trend uh, of the movement of Uyghurs into Southeast Asia since 2009 against the backdrop of uh, China's strike hard campaigns uh, and, and the uh, Urumqi riots of 2009. Uh, this also uh, corresponds uh, to reports of the deportations 
of Vegas, as uh, as I've um, showed earlier. And uh, in parallel to this development, of course, is the emerging evidence of Uyghurs being involved, uh, implicated in militancy and terrorism. Uh, briefly, uh, I'd like to explain the different categories of uh, Uyghurs in Southeast Asia and uh, perhaps uh, just take us back to the uh, direct, some of the indirect and direct causes that uh, scholars have referred to in um, attributing the, the reasons for Uyghur resentment. Um, and these, uh, these have been, just to summarize uh, some of these causes, which I think uh, uh, the earlier speakers have uh, elaborated in, in great detail, uh, these include the, the large-scale crackdowns, particularly in the wake of the 2009 Urumqi violence, uh, which, which saw uh, inter-ethnic clashes between the Han Chinese and the Uyghurs, um, securitization of Xinjiang social problems vis-a-vis -vis criminalization and tighter religious controls, uh, Uyghur resentment towards the government, uh, government's policies towards separatists and minorities, uh, as well as various uh, counterproductive effects of the central government's excessive devotion to stability maintenance. Uh, uh, in, in, in addition, uh, to, uh, the counterproductive state-led modernization effects in Xinjiang, uh, results of which have led to a rise in income in inequality be between the Uyghur and the Han majority, uh, as well as um, uh, environmental degradation of the land uh, in Xinjiang. Uh, as mentioned earlier by some of the speakers, uh, in recent years, we're seeing uh, increased pressure by Beijing to restrict the flow of Uyghurs into Turkey and Central Asia, which has led to um, uh, border controls, uh, stricter border controls there. And this has facilitated Uyghurs' decision to look towards Southeast Asia as a transit point. Um, in terms of the Uyghur movement into Southeast Asia, they can be categorized into um, Uyghurs coming to Southeast Asia as genuine refugees. Uh, Uyghurs using Southeast Asia to transit and on to Turkey. Uh, and last but not least, Uyghurs that um, are using Southeast Asia as militant ground. Uh, the first category of Uyghurs as genuine refugees, uh, those Uyghurs in Southeast Asia who are seeking to obtain refugee or asylum st status due to real or perceived grievances. And unlike um, the Turkestan Islamic movement, which moved in to supplant the threat from ETIM, uh, such Uyghurs are not actively engaged in armed resistance. The second category of uh, Uyghurs are Uyghurs who use Southeast Asia as a transit point. Uh, these uh, Uyghurs mainly enter into Southeast Asian countries, uh, predominantly uh, Cambodia, Vietnam, and Thailand and use them as a transit point uh, to travel onward to Turkey to seek political asylum. As well, there are also Uyghurs embedded within uh, this, uh, this, this group, uh, a Turkish Uyghur trafficking network that is believed to be based in Southeast Asia. And I quote what uh, Katalushi uh, referred to as uh, a network that was responsible for bringing terrorists from Xinjiang through Southeast Asia and onward to Turkey, where they are staged, armed, um, trained, and incentivized to fight NATO's proxy war in Syria. The third category of Uyghurs are Uyghurs um, that uh, are entering into Southeast Asia, uh, the pretext um, of linking up with uh, militant groups here uh, in, in Southeast Asia. Uh, there have been evidence of Uyghur involvement with the uh, Indonesian terrorist group, the Eastern Indonesia Mujahideen or the Mujahideen Indonesia Timor. Uh, the group operates uh, mainly in central Sulawesi's Poso and uh, has conducted training camps for um, Southeast Asian terrorist groups. Uh, this was evidence in the Uyghur involvement in the Aran Shrine attack in Bangkok, uh, Thailand on 17th of August uh, 2015 in which two uh, Uyghurs were uh, implicated. Um, so moving on to the theoretical framework for my paper, uh, this, um, at this point uh, we're looking at the potential for uh, uh, Uyghur refugees to become radicalized or recruited. Uh, and here I draw upon um, the uh, notion of the struggle for recognition. Uh, first, first off, uh, we begin with uh, looking at terrorists uh, 
as, um, as seen from uh, uh, scholars such as Mark Sageman who, um, who emphasized the importance of uh, social networks in, um, in mobilizing uh, individuals. And so here, uh, uh, my paper looks at terrorists mainly as social activists uh, who rely on violent extremist ideologies to mobilize action. Um, for radical Islamists like the Islamic State, uh, the necessity for self-preservation is tied to the struggle for recognition. Uh, what uh, um, Nietzsche defines as the struggle for ne uh, for recognition. Uh, I would, sorry, what Nietzsche defines as the uh, self's will to power is in fact uh, seen in in the eyes of uh, radical Islamists as a struggle, a fundamental struggle for recognition. Uh, for, furthermore, for red, uh, radical Islamists, the struggle for recognition is decidedly violent in nature. And um, the rhetoric of radical Islamists, uh, the Sikhs seeking to appeal to the disenfranchised and to maximize recruitment is seen in the following ways. And uh, the first uh, is the equation of violence with mor morality, uh, namely uh, the, the, no uh, the notion of jihad as a divinely sanctioned violent struggle. And secondly, the conflation of individual responsibility for the collective grievances, uh, in, which is seen in the notion of the Ummah as the, construct, uh, the constructed circularity between the self and the greater good or the larger, larger Muslim community. And in, the, in my next slide, I will briefly elaborate on how uh, radical Islamists use um, the, uh, the notion of jihad and ummah to appeal to um, individuals. For uh, radical Islamist groups like uh, the Islamic State, uh, jihad is seen as a divine, divinely sanctioned violence. Sorry, there's something wrong with the screen here. Uh, sorry. Uh, so for uh, radical Islamists, jihad is seen as a divinely sanctioned violent struggle and is fun fundamentally con consequentialist in, in nature. Uh, this, draw, this is theoretically in line with um, uh, scholars like uh, Halim. Uh, and the framing of morality in religious language provides the self with a basis for legitimizing his or herself in the overall struggle for recognition and is framed in moral quen uh, quen consequentialist terms. Uh, so such, such consequentialist terms to morality is not unique to uh, religious ex extremist uh, groups, uh, and in fact, is uh, very much in line with uh, universal narratives that are based on consequentialist uh, morality. Uh, for instance, uh, the, the means justify the ends. Um, in the second, uh, the second terminology, uh, the, the use of ummah by the radical Islamists, uh, is how they frame the uh, the word ummah. Uh, the, which is a reference to the collective Muslim community uh, to, so as to maxi maximize their recruitment. <coughs> and, and they do so by uh, referring to the individual and the collective in a constructed circularity, uh, thereby tying the individual responsibility to the collective. Uh, in the case of the Uyghurs in Southeast Asia, this implies that the appeal of transnational Islamist terrorist movements like the Islamic State uh, provides uh, Uyghurs not only with an outlet to give vent to their grievances, but also provide a moral and existential basis for legitimizing the actions, um, namely through um, using violence as a uh, means to avenge the grievances of the larger marginalized uh, Uyghur communities. Uh, and I will now uh, elaborate on some of the further conditions in Southeast Asia that uh, are conducive for terrorist groups to exploit Uyghur grievances for um, radicalization and recruitment purposes. Uh, the first of which is the persistence of Southeast Asian insurgency, terrorism, and uh, human smuggling uh, networks in this region. Uh, the second of which is the increased exposure by Southeast Asian countries to foreign sources of terrorism. And last but not least, uh, the Uyghur refugee experience in Southeast Asia uh, that uh, might exacerbate the existing uh, grievances uh, towards uh, the, the, the Chinese government. Uh, so in terms of the persistence of, uh, in terms of the 
uh, insurgency, terrorism, uh, and human smuggling networks that we're seeing in Southeast Asia. Uh, we we uh, we have see, been seeing ethno ethno separatists in certain groups and militant jihadi groups operating in Southeast Asia uh, for, uh, for for several decades. Uh, these uh, ethno separatist insurgents uh, in southern Thailand and southern Philippines uh, have been struggling for various degrees of autonomy, and militant groups continue to be inclined towards the ideology of the Al Qaeda linked uh, Jama Islamia. Uh, despite uh, significant uh, operational attrition of the group uh, in the 2000s owing to uh, concerted action by the regional governments. Uh, this problem has been compounded by the pro proliferation of human smuggling um, in some Southeast Asian countries. Um, and in a report by the Center for Strategic and International Studies on Southeast Asian Migrant Crisis, uh, three pro problems were, were noted relating to the refugee influx in Southeast Asian countries. Uh, this included the asylum protection facilities uh, for refugees, um, including the Rohingyas who are fleeing uh, Myanmar, Myanmar by boat, the proliferation of uh, people smugglers who have made their livelihoods ferrying migrants from uh, Myanmar before handling them to traffickers, and also the problem of trafficking along the Thai Malaysia border. Uh, which is interlinked to the uh, smuggling issue. Uh, the Uyghur refugees who were deported in July 2015 were also believed to have relied on a similar uh, regional smuggling network and trafficking network. Um, in light of uh, news reports of human trafficking camps that have also surfaced in, re um, in, in recent times, um, that uh, human smuggling and tra uh, trafficking networks may be indirectly facilitating uh, militant flows uh, gains further traction. Uh, the second element of uh, that that highlights uh, the perm uh, provides the perm permissibility of uh, um, these refugees to become co-opted by terrorist groups is the increased exposure uh, by Southeast Asian countries to foreign sources of terrorism. Of course, with the rise of the Islamic State. Uh, and here I quote uh, Daniel Byman, who, who, who writes in a recent um, uh, article on international security, um, as the Islamic State swept through Iraq, uh, slaughtering and enslaving Yazidis and retaking the country's second largest city, Mosul, and much of the Sunni-populated West, uh, the perceived threat grew enough to merit limited intervention. After the 2015 Paris and San Bernardino attacks, the perceived threat grew even more. Um, in parallel to this uh, development, of course, is the growing accessibility of social media platforms uh, facilitated by uh, globalization. Uh, radical Islamist terrorist movements like the Islamic State have used social media platforms in their propaganda efforts, uh, as is well noted by the Islamic State's um, uh, uh, well-sophisticated uh, uh, magazine, The Beak. Uh, Byman, Daniel Byman further notes that uh, as part of this identity, uh, the Islamic State stresses not only a sectarian danger but also the threat of foreign governments and insufficiently observant Sunnis. The Islamic State's sectarian ideology gives the group a natural constituency of Sunni Muslims from which to recruit and who are more likely to uh, support the organization when sectarian tensions is high. So using social media, uh, I, ISIS has attempted to exploit and to um, capitalize on the sec existing sectarian tensions, uh, as, as we see in um, um, in Southeast Asia, we see uh, taking place in Malaysia. Uh, as well, not forgetting the participation of Southeast Asian countries and more recently um, Singapore in anti-ISIS coalition efforts could also implicate the countries and render them increasingly prone to terrorist attacks and propaganda uh, by the Islamic State. Um, the internationalization of the Uyghur issue could be seen in light of Chinese responses to the Uyghur issue and in light of uh, Southeast Asia's relationship with China. Uh, ISIS as a transnational movement has been seeking to enhance and its appeal and reach in areas uh, beyond the Middle East uh, and uh, it mainly does so through uh, social media. Uh, finally, the growing footprint in countries like Southeast Asia, apart from countries like the Middle East uh, and North Africa, indicates that radicalized Uyghur separatists uh, that consider Southeast Asian countries hospitable to Chinese investments uh, may seek to target uh, diplomatic, political, 
and economic symbols of Chinese presence in the region, including embassies, railway lines, and Chinese commercial investments, as well as places of interest that are frequented by Chinese tourists. Um, in, in fact, uh, during the Erwan Shrine attack, um, there were six uh, Chinese tourists that were targeted. And uh, these, the attack was uh, supposedly carried out to avenge uh, Chinese uh, avenge the, the, the Uyghur deportation um, issue as well as the, um, the concerted crackdown on the human smuggling issue in, in Thailand. Uh, and the, third, the third factor which I look at um, in my paper is, of course, the Uyghur refugee experience in Southeast Asia. Uh, it has been well noted that uh, refugee camps serve as breeding grounds for radicalization and recruitment. Um, and of course, uh, I will not go into detail about uh, the uh, the state of the asylum facilities because um, the papers, as as I mentioned, are still still work in progress. Um, but as of now, uh, Southeast Asia does not have in, uh, formal any formal asylum facilities, and the inadequate uh, protection for these refugees. Uh, might be hospitable uh, for them to turn to um, ra uh, radicalization, uh, ra radical ideas, uh, and, may, and, and uh, terrorist groups like ISIS might uh, seek to co-opt them. So the increased resentment uh, by Uyghur refugees over their repatri uh, repa uh, repatriation and the disruption of human trafficking routes in Southeast Asia could result in a backlash from Uyghurs, uh, existing Uyghurs in, in Southeast Asia who are seeking to avenge their kin. And uh, I, I also look at the notion of uh, refugee warriors uh, uh, by Zolberg et al., uh, who uh, mainly looks at the potential for, um, uh, who in fact uh, defines refugee warriors um, as ref um, individuals that turn to um, um, uh, Zolba ref uh, regards refugee uh, warriors as uh, refugees engaged in the continuation of violence away from the conflicts in which they are fleeing. Uh, but in, in this case, uh, refugee warriors, uh, the, the term refugee warriors might uh, need uh, some further qualification in the sense that uh, these refugees who arrive as refugees, as genuine refugees, might in fact uh, uh, turn into uh, refugee warriors rather than uh, come into uh, Southeast Asia with the on the pretext of uh, ca directly carrying out uh, any kind of uh, violent attacks. Uh, in conclusion, in Southeast Asia, we're seeing an increased movement of Uyghurs into Southeast Asia. Uh, and this will see a concerted effort by Southeast Asian countries to clamp down on human trafficking and human smuggling networks. Uh, furthermore, the increased deportation of uh, Uyghur refugees will also result in backlash from the existing uh, Uyghurs in, uh, who are uh, staged in Southeast Asia who might seek to uh, avenge their, their uh, kin. Uh, Uyghur refugees' uh, existing grievances uh, present an opportunity for Islamic State to co-op into their fold. And the Uyghur, Uyghur uh, movement into Southeast Asia uh, indicates uh, likelihood for further attacks on Chinese targets in Southeast Asia. Uh, in terms of policy recommendations, uh, there is there's a need for strengthened counterterrorism cooperation between China and Southeast Asia. Uh, and I, I believe uh, Professor May uh, asked the question of in what uh, particular areas uh, do we need to look towards and. Uh, I, I think right now the, the lack of intelligence and information sharing between uh, China and the uh, relevant Southeast Asian countries is lacking. Uh, as well, there is a need for improved asylum facilities in Southeast Asia and last but not least, uh, in light of the international internationalization of the Uyghur issue, uh, there is a need to recalibrate uh, China to recalibrate its strategy uh, towards the ethnic minorities in Xinjiang. Uh, also known as East Turkestan to, to the Uyghurs, uh, so as to address their perceived uh, grievances. Uh, and last but not least, I just want to do a bit of a marketing 
marketing here. Uh, this is a recent handbook that uh, was uh, co-edited with uh, Professor Rohan Gunaratna and myself. Um, so if you're interested in understanding a bit more about the threat uh, in Asia-Pacific, uh, please uh, feel free to check out this book. And thank you very much. Thank you, Stephanie, for, for your presentation. Um, and Dr. Uh, Zhang will give his thoughts from, from the, the comfortable chair. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, well, first of all, I would like to thank the Michael for inviting me to this uh, conference. And uh, uh, well, I did attend the full conference, but I have learned a lot from the various sessions I attended. Uh, I would like firstly to congratulate Stephanie for choosing a very important and a very interesting topic. And that topic so far has been understudied. Because when talking about the international link of Uyghurs and uh, most uh, scholars, and focus on the international link between you know the uh, Uyghurs in the Central Asian state uh, to Middle East uh, or to Turkey, and also consequently, as we heard from the last session from Professor Lu, that uh, that led to even the creation of Shanghai Cooperation Organization, you know, to deal with that international link of the Uyghur issue, and uh, so uh, the. You know, growing uh, movement activity of Uyghurs in Southeast Asia actually reflect the new development uh, of the internationalization of Uyghur issues, and that could be have significant, uh, you know, implication both for China and for Southeast Asia. And I made that, uh, you know, uh, comment not because uh, as a generalized comment, but also from my own experience, and. Uh, uh, in in, in uh, Stephanie's presentation, she mentioned about the you know the bombing of the Uravan uh, shrine in Thailand in August 2015, and when that happened, I was actually in Xinjiang and in Ulumchi and attending the Xinjiang Forum. And when the news, you know, uh, uh, when we heard the news about that bombing, immediately that uh, became a topic of a discussion in the forum. And our colleague from Thailand actually say that uh, attack must be a retaliation about the Thailand's deportation of Uyghurs, you know, a few weeks ago. So in that case, we see how a domestic issue in China now become, you know, had a wider international impact, and which become a security issue for Thailand. So in that case, I think that's a very important topic, and. Uh, uh, I, 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 I think that uh, Stephanie did uh, well. And what I'm going to do in that uh, comment is that I would like to uh, make a few comments, because uh, I understand this is a work in progress. So I would like to make a few comments uh, for Stephanie to think, uh, and when, he work on, when she work on this uh, paper further, and also I will raise questions when I'm making comment. So I will start with the title of the paper. Uh, the title of the paper which I received is different from the title and uh, of the presentation. So that uh, is an interesting indication about it's how much it's a work in progress. And the title, I, well, the title of the paper I received is that Southeast Asia's Wiggle Militant Connection. It's a statement and which you claim there is a connection. But uh, the presentation, the title of presentation is a question. Is there a, question, a connection? So my first question to Stephanie is that uh, why the change? And what's your answer to the question? Is there a connection? If there is a connection, what kind of a connection is it? Is that a connection between the Uyghur militant group to the Southeast Asia terrorist uh, Islamic radical group to ISIS, or it's a li the link is rather, as I will comment later, or as you speak later, is about the Uyghur refugee has been radicalized during their experience, during their period in the Southeast Asia. So what is exactly the link, or whether there is a link, and why you put, put the question mark? So that's the first uh, comment on the title. The second comment is on the aim or focus of the paper. And the title actually gives us uh, impression, or my first impression is about the link between Uyghur militant group and Southeast Asia. When I read the paper further, up to page five, I found the stated aim of the paper 
is the paper's aim is to show how Uyghur refugees in Southeast Asia might be radicalized. So the whole purpose of the paper actually want to explain why the or how Uyghur refugee in Southeast Asia being radicalized or not. So if that is the case, that's nothing wrong with that uh, uh, focus. But uh, I my suggestion is that if that's the aim of the paper, and rather than state it in page on page five, I would like to state it on page one. So give a clear idea before we read those background section. Uh, then the third comment is on the theoretical framework you mentioned here and your argument. The theoretical framework actually you used is the so-called struggle for recognition. And also actually I see there are two different theory, body of theory you are using in the paper. One is that this struggle for recognition which is called the moral consequentialist approach. The other one is actually the literature on refugee experience and radicalism. And they are, it seems to me they are two different things, but you mentioned both. But anyway, uh, my uh, confusion or my question with regarding this theoretical framework is that uh, if we follow your theoretical framework and the struggle for recognition, as we see in the presentation, it's largely arguing that terrorists uh, seek to radicalize activists uh, through various means, turn them into, turn the refugee into radicalist. So in that case, I would like to see, you know, uh, the more of the analysis of, of how this happened to the uh, Uyghur refugees. And uh, you, you, you spend a lot of time to talk about this theoretical framework, but there are little information provided to you who actually try to socialize those Uyghur, uh, uh, Uyghur refugees and how, in what means, since when, and what are the consequences. And is there any evidence to show those uh, terrorist attack within Southeast Asia made by these Uyghurs are uh, actually the Uyghur refugees, because you separate them into three groups. Some people are genuine refugees, some people are translated from Southeast Asia, and some people are actually want to use Southeast Asia as a military ground, militant ground. So are this attack from which of these three groups? And so that's my uh, uh, question and confusion. And my other uh, query about uh, the uh, validity of this theory of radicalization of Uyghur refugees in Southeast Asia is that, uh, as I heard from Professor May yesterday, and actually he made an important point that uh, those people who move internationally, those Uyghurs who move internationally and trying to uh, uh, leave China, left China, are actually those who oppose Chinese government most. And actually, the, the, the real question are whether those Uyghurs are really radicalized so they left China or are they being radicalized in Southeast Asia? But anyway, I want to see more of the uh, analysis because the fundamental value of your uh, paper is not the theoretical framework, but rather the analysis of Uyghurs' experience and their radicalization using that theoretical framework. So we want to see the uh, analysis. And uh, lastly, uh, about, the, uh, about your conclusion, which come back to my first question, is that uh, I want to see, because when you talk about your conclusion, I want to get the answer to your to the question you raised in your title, is there a link? But then I found your conclusion is about implication, about how the movement of Uyghurs lead to a crackdown of human trafficking, et cetera, et cetera. That's a response of Southeast Asian government. But uh, my uh, concern is that what is, the con what is your answer to the question set at the very beginning that was the reason? So I will stop here. But anyway, it's a very good uh, uh, paper which addressed a uh, you know, very important question which is so far understudied.
first of all, thank you, uh, Professor Zhang, for for your really uh, detailed uh, and comprehensive uh, comments. Uh, they're well taken. Um, in response to uh, the first question about the link, uh, to be honest, uh, I, I'm still trying to establish that myself. So uh, I don't have the answer, but uh, I note that uh, within uh, discussions on uh, this Uyghur uh, connection in Southeast Asia, um, there have been criticisms that the link is um, tenuous at best. And uh, so I think it, it, uh, uh, I, I do have the, the responsibility to, to address the, the, this question in, in a way that uh, would uh, perhaps uh, shed light on, on, on this question. Um, so, but the, the question that I will focus on in, in my paper, I think, will uh, we'll look at uh, the extent of um, Uyghur militant connection in Southeast Asia. Um, uh, I, the other question, um, uh, I also note that the, the conclusion is not really well synchronized with the rest of the paper. Um, it was actually written in, in quite a bit of a rush, so uh, my apologies for that. Um, I, I, I hope yeah, I addressed it. Most of it is comment, that. yes. Most of it is yeah. comment to the question right. or suggestion. Thank you. Okay, I'm open for a question from the, the floor. All right. Uh, th first of all, thank you very much. I thought it was a very interesting paper. Um, and I think that it was, it was very balanced in the sense of, of uh, admitting how little we know um, to some of those answers that were, were actually being just asked. Um, you know, the, the character of these people, where they were radicalized, why they're radicalized. And I also really appreciated that you asked that uh, second question of why they're radicalized and looking at the grievance issue, which is often obscured in terrorism um, analysis. Um, one of the things that the question I guess I have for you is, it's, it seems to me that um, this situation puts the Southeast Asian countries in a very difficult position. And you had very interesting um, policy recommendations. And uh, you mentioned one of them being um, working with China, I, I believe. You, you mentioned that addressing the grievances inside Xinjiang. Um, and I'm wondering if they, you believe that Southeast e Asian countries may have um, uh, a better position to work with China on those issues, or um, are actually Southeast Asian countries in a very difficult position because they're also um, very, uh, very dependent on China, and might they not want to uh, push China on uh, some issues that they believe might be causing some of these problems uh, in terms of domestic policies? Um, I, I think uh, with the, with the uh, threat uh, of uh, terrorism becoming more internationalized, um, I think there's a greater impetus for China to work more closely with Southeast Asian countries. And I think we're seeing that uh, increasingly um, in, in, in the work that we do in some of these uh, engagements that uh, Chinese think tanks um, have actually uh, come to Southeast Asia seeking to um, um, exchange information on counterterrorism. Uh, so I, I think there's um, there's a recognition within uh, Chinese uh, foreign policy and and acad academia um, of the need to um, expand their counterterrorism um, knowledge as a whole. Um, but in terms of like the legislative aspects, there's a lot of room for uh, improvement, and I think uh, both our Chinese experts have um, uh, elaborated extensively on that, uh, and, and, and particularly in the um, the, oper um, the the room to operationalize um, some of these uh, radicalization counter radicalization um, um, measures in Xinjiang. Um, so in, in, from that, I think. Uh, the Singapore experience has some lessons, and uh, there is definitely a lot of room to leverage on the strengths um, in, in the Singapore case study um, on the part of Southeast Asia. So. 
Uh, thanks, Stephanie, for your presentation. Um, just one question. You've uh, segregated the people traveling into Southeast Asia into different categories. Have you seen in your analysis whether those different categories are using the same people smuggling um, chains or whether a refugee is using a different approach into Southeast Asia compared to a militant? Um, so far, the, the results that uh, from my conversations with the people on the ground, uh, we know that there are several routes into Southeast Asia and there's no, um, the Uyghur refugees are not uh, are trying to enter into Southeast Asia, of course, surreptitiously. Um, but the, 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 the main route uh, is uh, Cambodia, through Cambodia, Thailand, and, Thai, Thailand and Malaysia. Um, but I don't, I, I cannot, uh, I'm, not at, uh, I'm not privy to that uh, specific information. Yeah. Uh, that was my question, <laughs> but I do have another one. <laughs> um, I was just wondering, um, now that uh, Indonesian authorities have uh, practically dismantled the um, MIT and Proposo, do you think um, Uyghurs will continue, uh, in regards to that militant activity that you, you mentioned, will continue to come to Southeast Asia for training and for that, uh, that type of experience? And if so, where? Um, yeah, um, thank you for your question. Uh, you're right to note that uh, Indonesian forces have been looking for Santosa for some time now, uh, and they had uh, actually successfully managed to to, to, to kill Santoso. Uh, so with that, uh, the, 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 question, the question about leadership, or whether if you take out a leader, um, the network will crumble. Um, uh, I, I'm not uh, an expert on Indonesia, as, as uh, I, guess, um, I, I think we talked uh, earlier, um, but there are still uh, remnants of the, the MIT that, uh, it, it, even without a central leadership, is still uh, capable of operating uh, independently. Um, uh, in terms of the extent of their operational capabilities, their training, um, there are training camps, as you noted, uh, and uh, they ha have been Uyghurs implicated in, in these training camps. So um, uh, my my assessment is that uh, that they will still be active, but in terms of the uh, the strength of the operational capabilities, uh, I think to a certain extent it it, it has been uh, weakened with the uh, death of its, of the leader uh, Santoso. <coughs> Thank you for your presentation. I was just wondering, what is the, what would you say is the extent of the threat of Uyghurs joining these groups in comparison to perhaps other others that may be joining these groups in Southeast Asia, and what do you think this means for Australia? Um, okay, so there are two two parts to the question. I'll answer the first part um, of the, the the extent of the threat um, that Uyghurs joining. I think um, in the case of the Uyghurs, um, they they are particularly um, more uh, inclined to to. I mean, if you look at the Rohingya Muslims, um, they they have also um, been in the region, um, been been uh, there are large number of um, Rohingya refugees in this region as well. But but you know, then the question is why are they not as susceptible as the the Uyghurs um, to being radicalized? Um, I, I, I don't really have the answer, but uh, um, I mean, if we, we go back to the history of uh, separatism to in, in Xinjiang, I think um, Uyghurs have uh, been, uh, I think, been struggling for, for quite some time, and uh, I think their the movement into Southeast Asia will perhaps open up new avenues for, for their further um, uh, for the uh, further radicalization and for the uh, further exacerbation of their grievances, um, so the extent the, the extent of threat I would say is uh, moderate to high. Uh, in, in, in if if you were to put a quantitative quantitative um, indicator of, of the threat, um, and what does this uh, mean for Australia? I think uh, uh, Australia and so Southeast Asian countries, particularly with uh, Indonesia. Have had strong counterterrorism cooperation, and uh, and uh, I think continued counterterrorism cooperation is is the right step. In, it is a uh, yeah would be a right step in the direction to 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 stem the threat of further radicalization and recruitment by terrorist groups. 
Stephanie, um, can you know from the Department of Defence? Um, so it was an interesting um, presentation you gave, but I was just wondering that the movements of the Uyghur people seem to be predicated on the grievances, historical and current, that's happening in sort of, you know, and, um, and so I guess the sentiments uh, towards uh, the Chinese government. So we'll take this assumption then, if China was to, um, I guess, better or at least um, improve the policies there to address the actual historical grievances of um, this ethnic group, wouldn't that then alleviate the international communities, especially Southeast Asia countries, um, in their counter-terrorism counter sort of activities? Rather, wouldn't that sort of just alleviate our ISR sort of, you know, um, I guess, um, or the need for ISR specifically monitoring this group of people and the movements? Sorry, the I, I saw. Uh, so the intelligence, uh, surveillance, uh, reconnaissance. Um, certainly, I think uh, um, there, there's both a short term and a long term strategy. And uh, the long term strategy would, of course, uh, rely on the part of um, of, of chi chi uh, Chinese counterterrorism apparatus to to actually cut to the heart of the grievances. Um, but in the short term, we're also looking at um, Protecting our, our, our borders and um, keeps, um, keeping keeping the Southeast Southeast Asian countries safe from the threat of terrorists. So um, I think uh, addressing uh, on both ends there needs to be um, both measures, preventive, uh, preventive and um, preemptive measures as well. Yeah. I agree. There just needs to be two. Sort of, you know, but don't we usually encounter terrorism? A very short-termism approach to what is a domestic and sort of culturally sort of cultural issue that sort of should be addressed from a long-term perspective. Uh, yeah, I mean definitely uh, traditional traditional counterterrorism methods have uh, been predicated on ki kinetic approaches, um, but uh, increasingly I think uh, countries are more cognizant of the need uh, for uh, more uh, strategic uh, or uh, softer softer non-kinetic approaches. Um, such as terrorist rehabilitation, community engagement, and these, um, some of these practices uh, have been implemented in some of the Southeast Asian countries to, to, to a large degree of success. Um, so there, there is a need uh, for a balanced approach in countering uh, this new iteration of threat from, from, from terrorism and uh, with the rise of ISIS and uh, its associated networks. So I will first get you to, to thank Stephanie and our, our discussion. Uh, Dr. Zhang for their contributions. Uh, finally, just to just to quickly uh, wrap up uh, for for the event uh, overall. First, I'd like to, to thank all our speakers and discussants for their contributions, and in particular our our distinguished Chinese visitors for uh, providing a Chinese perspective on on some of these very sensitive uh, issues. Um, a key, key uh, goal of the conference was to systematically explore the domestic and foreign policy dimensions of this issue and I think most of the contributors have, have, have really drilled down in a, in a very deep way into a range of very complex issues and hopefully developed new understandings and new discussions I think more importantly uh, on, on this particular, uh, particular issue. Uh, and finally I'd like to thank you all for, for your attendance and, and interest uh, in, in, in the conference. Thank you.